during the past month, I'm sure you, like me, have watched the tragic news out of Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed through indefensible aggression by a policeman. We've seen racial injustice take place among the African Americans. And as a result, it has caused protests on the streets around the globe against discrimination. I was deeply saddened by the injustice and was really troubled by the abuse of authority that was taking place. Now, although there were peaceful protests, but I was also appalled by the violence, by the riot, by the looting of properties and the senseless murder of police officers that follow. It just demonstrates the depravity of man. See, prejudice does not only take place out there. It actually also takes place in our hearts. What has transpired has caused me to examine myself to see how I have shown partiality to a certain group of people. Maybe to have, have demonstrated a degrading attitude to, toward them. Well, what does the Bible have to say about prejudice? Why does it make no sense whatsoever to practice prejudice? How are we to treat one another? As a follower of Christ, how are we to treat someone that might be very different from us? What if they have less education than we do? Well, what if they make a lot less money than we do in our jobs? How do we handle those that are very different in thinking than we do? And what does true faith really look like? We see from the book of James that we've been uh, preaching through that the theme in this book talks about Christian faith and how it should be lived out. And we do ask the question, how does true faith look? In chapter 1, we see true faith is demonstrated in the midst of trial, through endurance, through being patient. And we also see true faith handling the Word of God by the, being a doer of the Word, and not just listening by itself. And last week, uh, we learned what faith, faith is. It is claiming certain belief, but not acting upon it. While well, true faith backs up what he believes with action. And we see it in James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. See, words are cheap. And true faith involves doing what God says that we need to do. James see that there was inconsistency among the believers there that he was writing to. He noticed that those believers are being influenced by the world. And James calls for consistency in living out their faith. And as we get into James chapter 2, we see that there are two ways how to, one ought to live out their faith. In the first half of James chapter 2, it says that we are to show no partiality. And in the second half, of chapter 2, we see that we should show good deeds. Those are demonstration or evidence of true faith. And for today, we're going to cover the first half of James 2. And for next week, we'll cover the second half. We see that James scolded the believers of their inappropriate attitudes and actions. James was disgusted with the believer's favoritism or partiality. 
that is totally incompatible to their faith in Christ. See, prejudice has no place in Christianity. Right off the bat, we see James commanding the believers to show no partiality. But instead, we're going to see later on in this uh, passage that we are to show love to our neighbors. Let us uh, turn to James chapter 1, begin at verse 1. It says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. See, James here commands to show no partiality. James is addressing the believers. James calls the recipient, my brothers. James does not waste any time as he confronts them with their wrongful attitude and their wrongful action of partiality. It is inconsistent to their belief as followers of Christ. One cannot hold on to the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and at the same time show partiality. This is totally incomparable. Uh, incom in in it is like mixing water and oil. You see Romans chapter 2, verse 11, it states that God does not show favoritism. And as followers of Christ, we are to emulate Christ, our, our Lord. And we also are not to show favoritism. In other words, how can one claim to have faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ if if we have favor on certain group of people over other, this does not make any sense whatsoever. Our behavior should coincide with our belief. If it is inconsistent, then it hinders others of wanting to follow after our Lord Jesus. James goes on in this passage to illustrate by showing an example of how partiality was demonstrated as it is recorded in, in verses 2 to 4. And this is what it says. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man you stand over there or sit down at my feet have you not then made distinction among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts so we see in this example, we see whether the believer really believe what they believe by, by their behavior. Is it going to be fake faith or is it going to be true faith? So there were two groups of people that came to this meeting and there are the ushers, um, as these two group of people came, they treated them very differently, just based upon their external appearance. One person dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelries received special treatment by, get, by getting a good seat up front close to where the law, the Torah, was located. And we see the other person coming with shabby, dressed in shabby clothes. He was looked down upon. He was given two possibilities as to where this is. He said, well, go over there. Basically standing in the back of the room or sit here on the floor. We see it, um, that uh, he treated the poor in a degraded manner. Well, the possible, the possible reason why uh, this usher 
catered to the rich is that uh, he thinks he might get something in return from the rich person. We see the usher, on the other hand, did, did not show partiality to the poor because he didn't think he was going to get anything from the poor. In various times, as we even look at ourselves, we see that we might be motivated to do nice things out of selfish purposes so that we might be able to get something in return. The way how we treat others also shows a clear demonstration of what we really believe. And too often, we tend to stereotype someone just based upon their external appearance. As we remember in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, We are told to not look at the outward appearance, but to look in the heart. And when we meet someone for the very first time, various times we tend to make certain judgment based on the external rather on the internal. We might look at the brand of clothes that he or she might be wearing. Or we might ask, uh, what school uh, did you attend? Or what major are you studying? Or we might uh, want to find out what job are you to, uh, do you have? And what position do you have at work? Or we might simply look at the color of the skin. And we base our judgment strictly on external appearance. And you know, that is just not right. We all know that it is improper to show impartiality. However, do we really believe that? How do we live out what we believe? Do we claim one thing, but then do another? If that is the case, then that is really fake faith. You know, one of the highlights uh, of my year is participating in the father-son camp. Actually, we alternate one year where we have the father-son and the following year the father-daughter. We realize that um, fathers uh, might be busy and do not spend as much time as the mothers with their kids. And, and, and we set aside this uh, special weekend retreat for the fathers to spend extended time with their child who might be in middle school. Well, I have the privilege of teaching dads and to guide them as to how they are to teach their children before they get, go off to college. And one question I'd like to ask them is to identify a list of values that they would like to see their child possess before they go off to university in four to six years. And I see that the father's. Uh, without a blink of an eye, they could come up with a list of various important values that they want their child to have as they go forth to college. However, when I ask them, what are they doing to reinforce these values with their child, we f I find that uh, various dads have um, a problem as to answering that question. It's one thing to claim what we believe. It is another is to practice what we believe. I told the dads that they need to constantly look for opportunity to teach and affirm those values that they believe in. And most importantly, they need to model for the child. They, they need to demonstrate to their child what these values are all about. And may we practice what we claim to believe. And may our behavior match our belief. Instead of showing preference, we as believers are to accept others regardless of their status or their class or their ethnicity or even gender. See, discrimination shows that one makes judgment on preconceived biases. 
C1 has already made a conclusion without knowing all the facts. We already categorized them, and we decided that they are not worthy to be treated like everyone else. We can discriminate by elevating some people, to, as we have seen in this passage. But we also can demonstrate uh, discrimination by degrading certain group of people. That is just wrong. It demonstrates evil thoughts or evil motive, as we see in verse 4. Now, to elevate certain people based on status or class or ethnicity or gender in order to get something in return, that is just wrong. And to degrade certain group of people based upon their status, class, ethnicity, or even gender is wrong also. You see, all people are created in the image of God. They are all precious in the sight of God. And James condemned prejudice and preferential treatment. Well, may we examine our hearts to see if there might be preferential treatment that we give to others that we admire, as well as degrade treatment to those that might be very different from us. You know, as Asians, we sometimes express our superiority over other races because we have a better education or a better job. As a result, uh, we put on a self-righteous attitude and uh, we look down at other people. We say, if they just work as hard as we do, they could get where we are at. We might call them certain names or we might avoid them altogether. Now, it is just not all about work ethics alone. We need to take time to truly understand their background more thoroughly and not just to make assumptions and judge them harshly. See, this whole uh, issue of racialism is very complex. But for some of us, it is just a blind spot that we cover up. We close our eyes to what is going on. And we might, we, we might say, well, if it doesn't really affect me, I'm not going to really worry about it. We become passive about it. Yet James is saying to us or commanding us to show no partiality. Partiality is contrary to God's plan and threaten others to following Christ. That is in, is not in sync with our belief. James goes on in this passage to explain the reason why partiality is unacceptable. And we see two major reasons. First, partiality is unacceptable because it is just foolish. It just doesn't make any sense. And we see this in verses 5 to 7. And the second reason is because it is unlawful. It's recorded in verses 8 through 11. Let us look at the first reason. And it is because it is foolish. It doesn't make any sense as we read verses 5 to 7. And it reads, Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world and to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom? He promised to those who love him. But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into courts? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? James explained that God has chosen those who are poor to be rich in faith and heirs 
of the kingdom because they love the Lord. See, one can be poor or rich in this world and still be poor in the next. It all depends upon what we do with Jesus Christ. See, God did not choose the poor because they are poor. But because they are poor, they realize their helplessness. And, and they tend to depend more on the Lord. And as a result, they choose to love God. On the other hand, it is more difficult for the rich to depend upon the Lord because they tend to be more self-reliant. They're tempted to trust in themselves instead of trusting in God. This does not mean that the rich cannot love God. It does not mean that they cannot be heirs of the kingdom. God values the poor's attitude toward God. Likewise, we ought to also value the poor also. However, James is not suggesting that we are to have reverse discrimination by treating the poor well and treating the rich poorly. James is teaching that we should remove discrimination altogether. We see in verse 6, that James claimed that the believers were discriminating and that they were dishonoring the poor. James is basically saying, when you despise the poor man, you are behaving like these unsaved rich people who mistreat the poor by exploiting and oppressing them as they drag them to court. See, these rich People are also slandering Jesus. They're saying evil things. They're saying evil things to the good name that was given to these believers. The rich are showing favoritism. And you should not follow their inappropriate practices. Instead of seeing them as an object that you could manipulate, you're to value them because we are all sinners that need the grace of God. So we see the first reason why partiality is inappropriate. That is because it is foolish. It just doesn't make any sense. The second reason why partiality is unacceptable is because it is unlawful. We'll see this in verses 8 through 11. And this is what it says. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are com convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails to one point has become accountable for all of it. For he said, do not commit adultery. Also said, do not do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So here it refers to the royal law, which actually goes back to the Old Testament. And we see specifically that James quote Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it commands the people to love their neighbor as themselves. When we do, when we do that, we are doing well, it says. However, on the other hand, if we show partiality, we commit sin. It is pretty clear here. James uses a different description 
to describe the law. It says it is a royal law because Christ is the true king who established the law. If the reader shows favoritism, then they have committed sin against the law. We have also seen in that same chapter in Leviticus 19, verse 15, says it warns us against favoritism toward the poor as well as toward the rich. We are to treat our neighbor fairly regardless of their status or it their ethnicity, or, or even their religious background, or even gender. A little bit over a year ago, I have a new neighbor that moved in directly across the street from where we live. It was a Turkish uh, family. They were very devout uh, Muslims. You know, as uh, devout Muslims, sometimes we might stereotype them by thinking that they're militant, that they, 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 they could be violent and so forth, and, and, and we could discriminate. But when they uh, first moved in, to, uh, I saw, uh, saw them, uh, the, a new neighbor, and I quickly to, uh, went over, introduced myself, and helped, helped carry some of their stuff inside. And later on that week, uh, Ellie and I... To, uh, we, uh, Ellie baked the cake, then we went over to, uh, to their place uh, to just welcome them uh, into our neighborhood. You see, they have very different religious background as we do. But uh, I saw that as an opportunity that we can build relationship with them. And during last uh, Christmas, I invited them over t- to our house. Now, the Jews had many laws. At times, they justified themselves of keeping all the important law and maybe letting a few go. One might claim that they've never committed murder or adultery. Therefore, hey, I'm okay. However, James makes it clear that violating one command makes a person a lawbreaker. It only takes one sin to make a person a sinner. We would deceive ourselves if we think our obedience to God's command can compensate for the acts of disobedience. So instead of showing preference, we are to show love to our neighbors, which is the royal law as recorded in verses 8 and 9. See, James is appealing to the readers to follow the royal law by loving and caring for their neighbors. They need to practice what they claim that they believe. See, faith and obedience go hand in hand. See, true faith must be demonstrated in action. See, to love our neighbor as ourselves is an Old Testament command. The Jews were commanded to love their neighbors or other Jews. They, they have a little different perspective toward the Gentiles. However, Jesus gives this command a new meaning by broadening the meaning of what this neighbor is. It includes even those enemies that we have, and particularly those that are very different from who we are. We are to show love to our neighbors. Favoritism is sin, and It is not keeping the law of love. Now, back in the early 1990s in Los Angeles, there was undue police brutality toward Rodney King, who was an African-American. Those uh, white police officers were acquitted for their wrongful 
action. And as a result, the black community erupted with anger as they rioted, burned down stores and property. David Hall, our, our elder um, who was living in L.A. at that time, he, as well as other uh, believers in his church, had a heavy heart. And for the next couple of weeks, they went out to the, to the streets there to clean up all the debris that were left behind. There, the, David uh, met an African-American pastor that, that had a past, that, that pastor in a church in that area. His name was Pastor Charles. He also met a Caucasian believer in the Lord. As they were cleaning up, uh, they, uh, although they came from three different churches with three different ethnicity, uh, they felt they need to partner together to demonstrate love to the community there. As they kind of brainstormed how they could best do that, they decided to go to the grocery stores on Saturday, realizing that the, that the stores were getting rid of various foods that they could not sell, but yet they could still be eaten. And uh, they would uh, load up uh, David's truck uh, with uh, this food, and they would bring it over to Pastor Charles' church, where volunteers would pack up these uh, uh, food in different bags and, and distribute it to needy people in the community as Pastor Charles preached the gospel. We, we see here a demonstration of great love to their neighbors. For every Saturday, for the next three years, Brother David and other believers went to the grocery store and packed up uh, the, the, the food and uh, they distributed it to the needies. That is a tremendous testimony of how we ought to demonstrate love to our neighbors. We need to really first acknowledge that there is a problem before us within our African American community, that there is discrimination that is going on. And discrimination is sin. It, dis it is displeasing to the Lord. May we instead, as we see in Scripture here, we are to love our neighbors. Now, it is easy said than done. We need the gospel. We need the Lord to change our hearts so that we might be able to treat people that might be different from us in love. May we not prejudge them and then go on to condemn them. May we seek to really listen to their story. Surely they also have shortcomings, as we also have shortcomings. And we are all accountable for God's royal law, no matter if we are believers or non-believers. We see the royal law is described in another way in verse 12. In verse 12 says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. It says this law is, is called the law of liberty. See, when we show love to our neighbors through speech and through action, that is what we will be judged upon. I do believe when we show love to our neighbors, it, it will set us free from prejudice. We are God's children, and we are to act as children of God. And when our behavior does not coincide with our belief, then it becomes a hindrance to others in following Jesus. Now, those who obey God's word in faith will find freedom from any fear of future judgment. 
The faith in our Lord provides freedom from hatred and self-righteousness for those that might be very different from us and acknowledge and, and, and it enables us to truly love our neighbors. I'm just really thrilled. Earlier during this year, we started the Mercy Ministry where we minister to our neighbors. Uh, we reached out to the poor and margins in our community. Uh, we were in the process of setting up a food pantry and various number of you help out there. And other volunteers have gone out to uh, our community, reaching out to the homeless, hearing them, caring for them. And may we show love through speech as well as action. You know, just as Christ demonstrated his mercy toward us, we ought to demonstrate mercy toward others. The gospel basically teaches us that we all need mercy. In spite of our shortcoming, God show us mercy. He loves us, although we are very different from Him. We rebel and we disobey Him. And yet we see that our Lord was willing to pay the penalty of our sins on our behalf and to adopt us as children as we place our faith in Him. We see that uh, mercy is not getting something that we deserve. God value us so much that Jesus Christ died for us. This is the mercy that triumphs over judgment as recorded in verse 13. Notice what it says in verse 13. It says, For judgment is without mercy, to one who has shown no mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Just as we have received mercy, we are to extend mercy to others that might be different from us. May we be motivated to forgive just as God has forgiven us. However, we see in verse 13, that if we do not extend mercy, we are demonstrating that we have not maybe truly received mercy. And because if we have received mercy, it should be natural for us to show mercy to others because God has changed us inside out. We live out what we really believe. Our behavior should complement our belief. Our behavior should complement our belief. We need to be careful not to misunderstand that this is saying that we need to be merciful to others in order to earn mercy before God. We cannot earn mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. If we believe, if, if we as believers demonstrate mercy, it is evident that he has received mercy from God. However, if one does not demonstrate mercy to others, then there may be reason to wonder whether if Christ, by his mercy, is within that person. As we stated in the beginning of the sermon, our behavior should match our belief. See, authentic religion or true faith is evident by our practice. We see here in James chapter 2, the authentic religion or true faith 
It's demonstrated is when we say there's show no partiality, but rather that we show love to our neighbor. Instead of showing preference, we are to show love to those that might be very different from us. And particularly showing mercy to others. May we show the life-giving mercy of Christ, which changes the way we act and speak toward others. For faith always demonstrates self through love. Let us pray. Father, um, well, we know that uh, because we're sinners, that there could really be prejudice uh, in our hearts. And Father, uh, we know that uh, you could change our hearts to others that might be very different from us. May we not show partiality. Instead, may we really learn to show love toward our neighbors. Not just those that are like us, but particularly those that might be different from us. And we pray, Lord, that you use us to show what you have done in our lives as you have shown mercy toward us, that we extend mercy to others. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.